there's lots of tickets available at Fulham tonight. <laughs> you say what? There's lots of tickets available at Fulham tonight in the Fulham end. Are you inviting me? No, I can't invite you because I'll be in the other end. <laughs> Are the Fulham fans nice? I know you're recording. I know, uh, you just said for the intro. <laughs> <laughs> it's fed to say it probably will not be a full house at Craven Cottage this evening. Why not? <laughs> because Fulham fans aren't showing up by the looks of it. Really? Is it expensive or is it... Yeah, they're taking the piss for a cup game, but... How much do they charge people? Uh, between 20 and 50, so I think, depending on where you sit. 50 pounds? Doesn't seem too expensive for, for a game. Carabao Cup second round. Yeah. Kind of piss. I would pay fifty pounds just to see who doggy play. You want you want to pay fifty pounds just to see who doggy? Just to see who doggy. Of all people. Oh, uh, wanna doggy. dance with who doggy? I wanna be do feel the heat with who doggy. Yeah, I like who doggy. Yeah, I wanna win the league with who doggy. I'm gonna be honest. I don't even know how who doggy looks like. I just like the name with who doggy who loves me. So just Here he comes. In. Anyway. Did he give you permission to buy these new bikes? He said he that says whilst they're bikes. better, it's like the difference between a Ferrari and a Lambo. We've already got Ferraris. Do we really need to get Lambos? So, I don't know. If you had a Ferrari and you could afford a Lambo, would you buy a Lambo? Yes. Right, would they go? In a dirty colour as well. Like Claret. <laughs> Illuminous claret, neon claret, neon and blue. green, neon claret and blue Lamborghini <laughs> incoming. Are we rolling then? Yeah, Should I start? It's been rolling for about four and a half minutes, mate. You do whatever you like. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything revolves around fantasy Premier League. My name is Such, and my name is James. Why did you say it like that? Such. Ah, I don't know. I'll just be in positive this morning, James. Positive. How are you feeling? You're right. All right. Yeah. Enjoyed a nice Monday off work. Yeah. It was yeah. Quite good. Yeah. Good. 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 Uh, we should talk about fantasy Premier League. We had a full stack of ten fixtures this weekend, just gone. Uh, unlike the week before, where there was only nine, and um, ended up being a interesting, decent weekend of football. If not, maybe uh, interesting, decent FPL weekend. Mine was particularly bad. Um, I was wondering Cots. why I dropped so far in rank, but then I realised I took a hit, right, to fix up my team a little oh, bit. Oh, what you like, 36 net. Yeah, 36 net. Um, you were 42, right, in terms of points. Yeah. So um, I had a rank drop overall, James, of over 1 million. Nice. 1.1 million rank drop from 400 and something K to 1.6 million, 1.539 million, which is massive. Yeah, well, it's early, isn't it? Considering six points between you and me, you had a rank drop of like 100k. Yeah, but I was... Six points was 1.1 million. I was at 33k. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's relative. But it is all relative. As a percentage, yeah, you've gone up 300%. I've gone up 300%. There you go. But in terms of six points, that's a huge drop to go, like, to, to a million and a bit places over six points. I was surprised how tight. It is, but I guess it goes to show that at the moment it's very, very, course, very course, course. congested. And I feel like it's more congested than a lot of seasons previously that we've had. Nah, it's the same as always. Do you think so? Yeah. Yeah. It's all these things like, uh, oh my God, the price rises are insane this year. It's the same every year. Probably. I think prob last couple of years we've started badly and worked our way up rather than started reasonably well, like inside the top half a million and then fallen back. Debatable if we've ever worked our way up yeah, in some well, cases. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting to, I, I feel like it's been a bad week, but I suppose this was the week, game week three, that so many people said, oh, everyone's going to have a good team this week. Everyone's going to have a good team this week. Well, I went into the weekend with uh, three Arsenal at home to Fulham. You'd think it's good. Uh, two Manchester United at home to Nottingham Forest. Two Brighton at home to West Ham. Ben Chilwell and then the three city attack. You'd think, like on paper, it was a good team, but City, uh, sorry, uh, you know, Manchester United leaking two goals early, Arsenal leaking two goals, one of Bright them very early, Brighton leaking three goals, 
and uh, Manchester City, to be honest, did okay. But it was it was it ended up the results didn't plan out as we'd wanted, and so everyone's good team on paper didn't plan out as we wanted. I did make three transfers, mind. Tell us about this minus four. Yeah, I sold. I, I wanted to get Alvarez in. Yeah, that was the lead domino in my decision making. I wanted to get Alvarez in. I had to make a decision on whether to sell Pedro or Mubama. And because of money being no issue, I ended up selling Mubama for Pe- for Alvarez and keeping Pedro. So I had a little bit more depth on the bench in the coming weeks. To sell to get Alvarez for Mubama, I needed two things. One to free up a Manchester City slot, which John Stones was stinking out with his injury. And the other was to free up money, which Trent was holding me up in. So Trent to Chilwell was a very easy move. Chilwell's ownership is going through the roof at the moment and is, has been, he's at 32%. I could see that going up still to 40-ish. Um, so Trent to Chilwell freed me up the money, also covered me off and made me that little bit more template, which is all we want to do right now. So Chilwell to Trent gave me the money. Stones, I needed to move on. Uh, and I decided to go with Botman, who is now flagged, unfortunately. <laughs> But it's one of them things. I think but I didn't see myself playing Botman until game week five or six after the international breaks. So actually, yeah. it doesn't really matter. I get that. Um, and then that gave me the money to get Mobama to, to uh, Alvarez and still leave me a million in the bank, James. Um, I decided to go Botman over Trippier. If I'd have gone Pedro to, to, to Alvarez Mbama, instead of Mobama, I could have gone Trippier. But I just decided in two weeks' time, that's a big difference between Botman and Trippier. Two million pounds. And considering they'll get the same clean sheet points, was the two million worth the Trippier upside for attacking returns? Nah. Bonus points. Also, I thought, nah, because if they keep scoring goals like like Newcastle have been, I think the attacking players are going to hoover up a lot more of the bonus points than they were last season when they weren't scoring buckets of goals but keeping clean sheets. So I decided that Trips wasn't worth the extra. Just get Botman in done and leave him be. Um, so that's the that was the move, those are the moves I made um, with Alvarez being the risk and I know a lot of people are um, cold ish on Alvarez but then everybody that was was talking about Alvarez being a potential risk was saying that well Bernardo comes back into the team Alvarez is the one that's most likely to get left out well it was Foden that got left out yeah but FFS Foden had the shits. Well, so we're here only this morning <laughs> as I come in and sit down here. My, I looked at it and I looked at it over five weeks because City have got five good fixtures, right? My goal in those five weeks out of Foden, Alvarez and Holland would be 100 points, 20 points a week out of the three That's of them. for, 90 from Holland and five each. <laughs> well, 20 a week. And I think I could actually, should actually be hoping for a little bit more, if I'm honest with you. But if I've got 20 a week... Well, if you're going to captain weeks, Holland nearly every week, well, there's yeah. a case, yeah. Uh, not if he's missing penalties. I've got, I got 16 out of the... Th- uh, sorry, uh, I've got uh, 14 out of the three of them this week. It's not the worst. Um, and should Foden come back you probably into the just want to remove week. Holland from that equation and ask what you want from Foden and Alvarez six a week for, for the for the five weeks so 30 out of each of them so, so 60, 60. Yeah. yeah another 20 out of Holland so plus captaincy I wasn't captain, count, doubling up captaincy okay fine so yeah I'm hoping I'm hoping 25 to 30 out of each of them and that's when I'll judge it okay yeah and I equally think that there could be a week where between the three of them they, they smash me in 40 45 points um, hopefully Fulham at home this week, mate. Okay. Uh, I was going to roll this week and then Thursday night, David Ornstein dropped the news of Luke Shaw's injury and decided to have a rethink because obviously my intention was to start Luke Shaw this week and bench Jao Pedro. Um, didn't take me long to come to a conclusion because although I could have still rolled, my thought process was that Luke Shaw was absolutely on the chopping block for me this week going to Arsenal. So it was a case of, right, let's put some money in the bank now was very much what I was thinking. So I bought Serge Malagusto. Yes, I'm a genius. I benched him. <laughs> Didn't you know <laughs> that he was going to return in that ridiculous way? <laughs> Did you not know? That's a shout out to someone who was on my deadline stream. Um, the, the reason I benched Gusto rather than Pedro and I think by Saturday morning, it was quite clear in hindsight, I would have made a different decision. But I, I thought Brian would tell you a new one. 
And yeah, my, I know. My, 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 gen, my general you thinking... realise we're champions of Europe. Yeah, of course, mate. <laughs> so I kept hearing your fans telling me at the, yeah. at the Amex on Saturday. I will tell you every ground we go to, mate. I'm, I'm <laughs> no doubt about it, mate. Um, I thought even... To be honest, I was thinking even if he's a substitute, he could go off here. Mm. That was my thinking. So I thought, you know what? It was more a case of... I thought, if Brighton do tear him a new one, and he starts, and I've left him on the bench... I'm thinking to myself, what have I done? Yeah. What have I done? And I did think Gusto would play for Chelsea against Lewin, but I wasn't convinced about it. I really did think there was a strong case that any of those defensive players was a little bit of risk. Now, by deadline, I knew, right? But he didn't change my decision. I I'd, I'd decided there was no way I was going to bench Pedro because I really thought Brian were going to go off this weekend and I couldn't live with it that way. This way I could. Plus, despite all that domination Chelsea had against you in game week two... Gusto didn't get that far forward. No. He played as a right back. Now, as a wing back, this was very, very different. And obviously got two assists. One of them didn't have a huge role in, but it's great assist for Sterling's second assist. And uh, he's obviously gone off pretty nicely there with a full team pointer. Good news is, obviously, the fact that I bought him last week pre-deadline means I've got him in at 4.0. And I'm just watching his value fly now as everyone else goes there. What's he up to now? It'll be 4-1 and be 4-2 before the next deadline. Almost certainly. No surprise there. Don't even think, four three is not even impossible, but I would four two most likely. It felt like um, this weekend, like in the, in the first few weeks of FPL, we've been talking about midfielders quite a lot because there's such a volume of uh, availability of talent there, and um, the the story had been six point fives because we'd had Diaby, Mbomo, Mitoma. Who are someone missing at six point five? All all doing particularly well and putting their hat in the ring as considerations, I think all the sevens have put their hand up and said, hello, don't forget about me. In terms of Sterling came good. Foden's now looking pretty tasty. Jared Bowen has been returning in the last couple as well. Richarlison. Not. But Madison, I would kind of put in the bracket, but he's, he's seven. He was seven and a half when he's seven, seven, now, seven. Yeah. yeah. But in that sevens now, and, and Luis Diaz as well, it's like that little patch of, a group of players that were just above the six and a half are also now really interesting. And um, Sterling obviously came good. Foden benched, but still picked up the assist. Like, pe- benched on four points still is... I'll take that all day long. I think he can thank his mate Rodri for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Rodri's, Rodri is another conversation. Like, is there going to become a point where we're like, fine, it's okay to spend 5.7 million on Rodri? Um, yeah. Yeah, you could make a case that he might be best uh, under six million midfielder in the game at the moment. Purely because the fixture's coming up. One of the trends you can see from City's first three is against Newcastle, not a lot. Against Burnley, Sheffield United, loads of efforts on goal. Mm. Um, and you've already mentioned the good fixtures City have still got to come. I'd almost, I'd be surprised if he didn't return an attack and return in the next four. Mm. So, yeah, it's not a long term pick, but over these next short of fixtures, I don't, I don't hate it. It feels almost like you're blocking the third city spot as well, as worth saying. So it won't be for me, but I'm sure he'll return. I know sitting there with him in the team, we're obviously going to be laughing about it at the moment. So good luck to them. Best asset in Sky Fantasy, Serge. Oh, mate, don't even, um, don't even uh, get me going. Returns that. for me this week, Chilwell 6. Uh, would have been a lot more if he didn't press the wrong button on the PlayStation when he went through one on one. 8 for Bukayo Saka, 7 for Marcus Rashford, 5 for Ollie Watkins, who's. Just ticking over. Uh, eight for Captain Haaland. The only thing with Ollie Watkins ticking over is they scored three at the weekend. They scored four the week before. There's a thing last end of last season was his goal involvement was like 50%. And it's still, I mean, the assist is still chipping in. But I just see Diaby now, he's got on the score sheet again, as um, the better choice because of the price difference between the two of them. He might be, but the Watkins going nowhere for me. Yeah, it's it's not a problem that you have to fix. It's it's <sighs> one of those ones. where needs versus wants that we talk about quite a lot. Are you are you thinking, like, I've had a bad week, you've had a bad, any week below average is not a good week, and any rank drop is not a good week. But I don't look at my team and think, panic stations and I've got bad players in, in my squad. There are a couple that are on the chopping block potentially for me now um, and neither are desperate but one is uh, Onana 
United don't look right and there are other good options available. I feel like Flecken has stepped into Raya's boots and become Raya Mark II people in terms only, of the same save points and the same kind of clean sheets. People only want to talk about him when he had a shit pre-season. Everyone's gone without no one wants to talk about him now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's ticking over nice. I think... Yeah, it was like, w- w- the reason I look at it is, um, what did Raya used to do in Sky Fantasy, which was a lot of save points, because they used to allow shots outside the box and he used to tick along nicely. I think Flecken's doing similar in terms of saves and, and what have you. And the other's Martinelli, I think I can move on, because I think I can go from Martinelli down to uh, a, a cheaper player, and it may even be Diaby. Um, I don't have any need to make any transfers this week other than I've got five players in the Manchester United-Arsenal game. It's worth saying though, Serge. Obviously, next two for United are Arsenal away, Brighton at home. Then there's a great run up to a roundabouts game week 14. Like, Yeah, Anana's the same as Watkins. You, you knew, I don't need to fix that right now. You knew now. that Anana was going to walk into these two games. Right? And I don't so, need money. So my, my move, I, I'm, I'm going to leave him in for a little while. Um, but if the luxury came, where well, say I rolled and I really had nothing else to do, I could fix it. Um, Martinelli is on the chopping block for me this week, potentially. And um, I'm not sure what to do because I've got uh, a Diaby is one that I'm definitely interested in. I still think Mbomo has got very good fixtures. Madison's put his hand up as clear. Like he's, he's talismanic in the sense that he's, it's goals and assists and Certainly driving playing forward. playing like a talisman anyway. Yeah, so the choice is there. So I might actually leave it a week and not force myself into the decision. Um, it's a home fixture for Arsenal against Manchester United, so I might just stomach it and, and, and go with it. Um, are you thinking about any transfers yet or wait and see? Yeah, but I'm going to be wait and see. We've obviously did, and I know most teams will obviously rotate, but get these Carabao Cup games out the way. Not that I have too much involvement, but obviously the, the two Chelsea boys would be a good example. Uh, Watkins probably doesn't play Villa's second leg against Hibernian, but I'd, I'd rather wait a little bit this week, I think, make sure I've got information because one bit of team news could could definitely define my decision. I've got three million in the bank, so there's just so much I can do um, in terms of moves. So, obviously, Lewis and Garnacho um, are sitting there doing nothing for me. At the moment, the bus team's got Jao Pedro in it because I'm a bit of an idiot. It definitely has Gusto in it this week as well. I've got Saliba first sub at the moment, so I've certainly got cover this week, so I don't need to panic from that perspective. But with that three million, there's a lot I can do, right? Garnacho to Foden, Garnacho to Madison, João Pedro up to sort of like Isak, Isak, Nunes level, uh, hold the money back perhaps for Kieran Trippier in a couple of weeks. There's a lot I can do with that three million in the banks. It doesn't feel worthwhile going early here for the sake of something. I want the information. Like Madison could could well, I don't think it'll start for Tottenham tonight, but he'd probably be involved. Like if if that was to be my conclusion, I'd rather get through tonight. But yeah, I'm thinking about him more and more. Interesting stat on him, so I think he's he's returned in eighteen of um he's returned eighteen attacking returns in the last twenty Premier League away games, which is staggering when you consider he played for a team that got relegated last year. Yeah, yeah. Um so Burnley away, Sheffield United at home. The thing with him as well is versus some other players. You do still feel, even with those sort of Arsenal-Liverpool fixtures afterwards, that if Tottenham were to score in those games, there's every chance he he may be involved. He's obviously in and around a lot of the set pieces. The goal he scored at the weekend was, I'd say, probably fair to say, not James Madison-like in the sense of him running through on a pass. It's normally him playing that sort of pass. So, yeah, I can't beat that Richarlison drum anymore. It's definitely not. So, uh, Madders is well on agenda this week. I think it's most likely to be one of him or Foden for me. The, um, the the Saturday was a rare day where both Spurs and West Ham were playing away from home, and we watched it all together here with it's, the patrons at the office, which was which was a good laugh. Shout out to all of you that came along and joined us for the day with a bit of poker and a bit of mucking around. It was good good laugh. Those who were here early now know how nuts I am. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, but when top, we're talking when about a Spurs playing, midfielder, I should clarify. we're talking about midfielders. I also. Uh, want to stick James Ward-Prowse as a potential in there for me as well um, that I might go to. Just his price at 6 million is so interesting. I now back West Ham to score in most games just because of the set priest threat is ridiculous and he's taking all of them. All of them. He will do, won't he? And obviously his open play creativity for, for putting balls through and stuff as well. At 6 million, I think he's going to tick along 
really nicely now, and I think that's a great price. Looting away this Friday night. Mm. There were some tough fixtures in between, but when you're looking at like set priest threat and stuff, I think he's, that, he's tick along, say, tick it's, along it's, the ball. This Man City at home and Liverpool away afterwards. Yeah, yeah. It does feel more like a comeback. But we're now title contenders, James. So we yes, of course to, you are. Of yeah, because you're uh, so massive. Massive. Uh, v dot massive. <laughs> Let's talk about some of these games as well, because we are going to get to that Brighton game and we'll talk about Spurs and your team winning as well. Starting with the Friday night, though, Chelsea 3, Luton 0. We did think Chelsea would win um, and ended up being particularly comfortable. Raheem Sterling is back to Raheem Sterling. Uh, 7.1 million now, only 10% owned. 19 points is a monster I return. Mean, I, I've obviously mentioned Madison and Foden. Sterling, actually, in fairness, is absolutely in that bracket as well. Oh, although, yeah, 100%. Although I'm probably of the persuasion to think the hall's gone. Um, but certainly, Forest, Bournemouth, Fulham, Burnley yeah, in the next I know, I know. four of the next it, five. It could still be there. And the and Villa game is at home. What's, what's interesting with him versus... Uh, I, d- I don't know if this applies or not. With Tottenham... He does feel like the goals will be quite spread this year, I think. Um, with Chelsea, you do look at the team at the moment, I think, who's scoring them, I think. Mm. You don't really see any of that midfield trio, I think, particularly feeling like it's going to overly contribute. I, I'm referring specifically to, obviously, Fernandez, Gallagher and uh, Casado now that he's in the team. So you're looking at Chilwell, Sterling, Jackson. You are, Unless it's from set pieces, you are looking at it, think, where's, where's where's the goals coming from? So there's definitely the potential there for him to become a bit of a talisman. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, Jackson got off the mark as well, which I think will help his confidence no end. If you were, if you were buying today, considering Sterling Jackson the same price, uh, disregarding midfield versus striker slot, who would you pick? Straight most points you, to be scored. If you disregard it, probably Sterling. Yeah, I but do that, feel like Jackson's but it, but it, a lot of hold up does, play and bringing players in. It does also good feel like it's quite Sterling. dependent on what you're selling. Will probably just literally define the answer. I think it will probably be quite close. We should say there's every chance Chelsea will obviously add additions to their team this week. That's a what, to be Chelsea honest, buy players. That's also a very very big, <laughs> an even bigger reason than the cup games to wait on transfers this week is transfer window shuts Friday. It will still be open when the deadline closes on Friday, as in the FPL deadline. But yeah. There'll be, you know, something will break on Friday morning. It's completely unexpected, and it will possibly have a, a bearing on FPL thinking. So that's another good reason to wait this week. And a special thank you to Ben Chilwell for not getting injured and surviving another game. I'm going to thank him every week that he doesn't get injured. It'll probably last it, another two I take weeks. It you've seen this incident where he didn't shoot. You're going to tell me you haven't seen it. No, have you? I didn't see it. Have you I not seen it? Why didn't he shoot? It's one of the most bizarre things you'll see all season. So there's a turnover and the ball gets fed into Jackson. He lays a, a lovely little crow flick off into Chilwell's path. And he's he's running kind of at a diagonal straight towards goal. And he gets into the penalty box and he's there. He's just got the goalkeeper in front of him. And he, he, I cannot describe it any better to you other than say it's like someone playing on the PlayStation or the you Xbox. Turn around and, and, keep the other way. and they press the wrong button. Yeah, press the run back. He tried and he tried to pass it. There's actually an angle where you can see just before he he, he shoots, he actually looks up at the goal. So it's not a few people saying, "Oh, he never looked at the goal." He did. He looked up at the goal, and I don't know why he decided to pass it. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. No. There's not anybody in their right mind would have would have not shot. Stefan Freund would have shot in that situation, honestly. I don't know what he was thinking. Anyway, grateful for the six point return. Obviously, Luton played two, lost two. Conceded yeah, seven look, now. This this would have been expected from the first two that they had. Um, I thought they were quite well organised, actually. Um, and they were never kind of really out of the game, certainly at 1-0. But I do think individually you, you're going to get mistakes in and around the penalty box. You've got that typical trait, if you look at Sterling's second goal, that typical trait of kind of fear of going to defend the six-yard box rather than actually where the ball might go. Um, so I think you will get individual er- errors within the penalty area, which means players in there who are going to get regular touches like a Raheem Sterling does are liable to return against them. But there's no judgment on them. Those first two games, awful start from. They've, I've actually got them top of my FDR for the next six. So I think Issa Kabore, um, obviously the right wing back, and Colton Morris up front might be something that works. So an example, we spoke about this with Dan Ashby on Clash of Correspondence last week. You want to get rid of Pedro, you've got no money in the bank, you want to forward at that value, actually you probably can punt him for a little bit. 
in Carlton Morris. And Kabore offers a really nice kind of backup pretty much all the way through to around about game week 10, actually, if you want to downgrade. Probably one for those who've already got Gusto because I think you would pay that little bit extra at the moment. Gusto will be affordable to everybody, won't he? If they don't have, it's so difficult to go there. Um, good for Jackson to to get his goal as well. Um, it was interesting watching the game and having a look on social media at the time. It was really dividing opinion. A lot of people saying his touch is good, his movement's good. But uh, every every kind of third comment was like, he's a car horse, he's shit, he's right. And I don't see it that way at all. I, nah, I, I think I, he's I don't, decent. I don't see him as someone he's who's going to get like 25 Premier League goals. Do I think he could be a decent FPL asset for someone with this run coming up? Yeah, and if you've gone there... you. You're going to stay. You're, I think you're going to be okay with that. Would there be a bit of disappointment? He only scored once against Luton. If forward of that value gets any return, I would generally be quite happy. So you run with that. Um, Jackson's a no for me currently. So you're supposed to go back to your point. I, yeah, that's I, the same. I, I could I, go... I could, Martin to Sterling is doable for me. I don't really want to be going from Alvarez or, or Pedro to Jackson. Yeah, nah. and I, I think Raheem will score more points. Go, Remember, extra point for a clean sheet, extra point for a goal. doesn't seem like a lot. But over three or four games, four or five points that adds up. I could go Pedro to Jackson. I can obviously, as I said, I can go Garnacho to Sterling. I could drop Rashford to Sterling and keep even more money for perhaps a, a bigger move down the Salah. line. Yeah, not that I'm convinced that's going to be worth paying for at the moment, but I'm I'm very conscious of that sort of game week eight, nine kind of flip for Liverpool where the fixtures do look really good. Um, and it could land in my lap that I end up going, I can go Rashford to Salah in one move, right? It's interesting. I know a lot of people are looking to come off. I, I might flip it the other way, but if I go there, it's like a commitment then, mm-hmm. and I'm not. I'm not convinced. That's I'm not convinced. I want to do that. On Sterling, what's interesting? Obviously, the first goal was a great goal, right? Beautiful little run, finishes it well. But just before that, he had a similar little moment, and I just thought, it's so typical Sterling running down a blind alley, here, and he's, he's kind of like he's overdoing it, taking the extra touch and something, and then. Within a couple of minutes, he'd flipped the narrative on its head. Certainly, as we said this time last week, like he was really good against you. He looked back to his best. He First looked fitter, half. leaner, quicker. Yeah, he tailed off a bit second yeah. half. So, so did so did his teammates. Yeah, right? yeah. So and I think getting that I return now and that confidence. His interview after the game was was really good. He spoke about being in a, a kind of better place in terms of his confidence and stuff. So yeah, look, there's still good fixtures to go. There would be a bit of probably knocking myself on the head going, I missed it. But to be totally honest, I was never close to buying Raheem Sterling last week. Me neither. I, I don't think I'm going to this week either. To I be haven't totally ruled honest. it out yet. I, no. don't, I don't think I am. I'm obviously on the two now with Chilwell and, and Gusto and the intention would be go with um, with double with them this week. I was probably a bit annoyed with myself, not the, the benching Gusto. I was probably a bit annoyed with myself reflecting on it more that I didn't think Chelsea would play a back three. Two reasons for that. One, it's something I've obviously seen Pochettino do in the past when he's playing against a team who play a front two and Luton are a rarity in the sense that they do do that and play a front two. Um, and also just on sheer personnel. Obviously, Mudrick obviously picking up a problem last week where I think there's every chance that he may have started might have forced the issue even more so because they're not blessed with attacking options on the bench at the moment. So I probably should have seen it coming that they'd go to a back three. I'm not convinced it will stick though, because I do I do think it could have been part of that that Luton played a a front two. I wouldn't be expecting Gusto to to do what he did at the weekend very often, to be honest. But I can't give people a reason not to go there. Definitely don't buy Malang Sar, by the way. Did apparently, you, apparently, did, did you see that? Uh, Poch doesn't even know who he is as uh, it stands. Brutal and part funny, but also. Pretty bad. Yeah, very bad. Um, he didn't handle it well. Then he kind of laughed his way out of it, Pochettino. But yeah, basically, if you didn't see it, he got asked about Malang Sar in a press conference and what had happened to him. This is after the game. And Pochettino who? said, who? Yeah. And then he looks for advice. And he obviously gets some advice and you can tell Pochettino is still quite puzzled. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like he was trying to style out. He still doesn't know who this is, um, which right. is a little bit concerning. But in any case... Um, just one a final point, Luton. Actually, I was quite impressed with the goalkeeper. Okay, I thought Kaminsky looked good in goal. Not that's not to recommend him as an FPL asset at all. But yeah, that little run coming up: West Ham at home, Fulham away, Wolves at home, Everton away, Tottenham at home, Nottingham Forest away. It was a good six, and those struggling for money will do worse than Colton Morris. I think there'll be returns there. 
They'll have no points. Uh, Bournemouth they will, nil. They will, they will get points. Their style, Bournemouth nil, Spurs particularly in games at Kenilworth Road, Serge, is going to give teams a bit of trouble. We'll find that on Friday night. We will. Bournemouth nil, Spurs two. Uh, good win for Spurs. Uh, but I don't think Bournemouth were that bad. I mean, in the first no, half, all. I feel it was, it was actually a bit similar to, the, to our game where they had chances. They were getting into the final third, getting into the box, getting shots off. Nothing of like exceptional quality. No, no, no big chances. No, same with with uh, with Brighton. But but at any point, if you switched off, you felt like they could be in and score. Like it was, ne- you never felt comfortable enough that we're coasting here. No, no, we weren't. We weren't. But um, also, they weren't like tearing you apart and like really in behind with quality either. It felt like a fairly even game. But you, when you countered, were just that bit more decisive and and clinical. Ended yeah, up, I think up telling um, the Spurs. two two things won the game. Um, Angie's understanding of what was going on and bringing Hoiberg on, um, who's not kind of really been featured predominantly through these games so far in pre-season, was absolutely the right change. It needed a little bit of experience and understanding of what was going on the pitch in that situation. I thought Pierre did really well when he came on. And obviously shortly after that, we got the second goal. It was the start of the second half, Bournemouth were playing really well. You could you could feel momentum come in and it was a bit of nerves. And the only real moment of real concern was the, the long-range effort from Semenyo, which has beat Vicario, all ends up, and obviously hits the outside of the net. Super effort. Um, just a note on him, obviously 4.5 forward. I'm not massively going to put anybody off going now. Just an awareness that Dango Tara, as and when he gets fit again, probably will go back in there, I think, as first choice. But yeah, lively. You'd said game week one when he came on very lively. He's obviously, he got the goal at Liverpool. I thought he played quite well against us as well. Yeah, they're a threatening side, actually. I've I've said to you a few times, I know our patrons will know from a few bits I've done, I think they'll do all right this year, Bournemouth. Mm. I think there should be a little bit of grace and understanding their fixture run continues to be absolutely awful till basically they go to Goodison Park in game week eight. Um, they've got, uh, who have they got this week, Suge? Who, Bournemouth? Yeah. I can tell you in a second. It's Chelsea in five, isn't it? Um, and they've got Arsenal at home in seven. It's a rough run of fixtures anyway. That they've they've still away got coming at Brentford up. this week. Away at Brentford. And what's in six? Uh, after that. It's not City, is it? Uh they play New, uh, sorry, New Chelsea at home. Chelsea at home, and then six. And then they play Brighton away. Brighton away, yeah. And, then, and then it's Arsenal at home. In seven, it is yeah. rough. It is rough. Yeah. What about Spurs assets? We talked a lot about Madison already and um, and his potential. Richarlison obviously getting hooked at 60 minutes. Doesn't bode well for him. I don't think anybody would be going near Richarlison potentially at the moment. But um, Madison seems a much better option. No, I'm hoping that Richarlison starts tonight at Fulham in the Cup because I just think you just for need confidence. to... Confidence. Yeah, yeah. hopefully he'll, he'll return tonight. And that. He, he's definitely short of it. Um, I've got major question marks about A's ability and B, uh, he's fit in this team, which kind of feels so jovial at the moment all of a sudden. And he walks around like he's pissed off constantly all the time and like the world is against him. Um, but I've also said, for those who listen regularly, I'm not going to go and be overly critical of him till he's had a run of sort of 10, 12 games. And I think that's what he needs and also partly deserves as well. From the FPL perspective, yeah, I think it's unfortunately probably want to cut it I don't, it's not even a guarantee that he starts on Saturday now because they can always put Sun through the middle and Perisic out wide or, or Solomon out wide there's different things he can do I would be surprised if that was the case is what I'd add because I think there is an intention to do kind of exactly what I said give him a proper run give him a proper chance at it but he also he has to do better than what he did on Saturday it's not the finishing stuff. It was all the stuff in the build-up was pretty concerning, particularly in the start of the second half. Wrong decision-making a lot of the time. Must do better. Um, so Brandon Johnson's a name being touted around and, a lot and I, now. And I do, do you think he could be a replacement, potentially? No, no, no. I, I think, arguably, that's possibly thought as more competition for Kulazewski, mm-hmm. I would have thought. Um, but obviously, he's another one who could play there, as can Son as well. And I think Tottenham wants to start getting those sort of players who can. you can almost 
the team will come out and you're not sure where one or two players are going to play is not a bad position to be in. So he does sound like that, but I'm also aware of Chelsea's existence. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, and they have been reportedly interested as well. So I wouldn't bank on anything happening from that perspective. But yes, he probably does leave Nottingham Forest this week. It does sound like. So from the FPL perspective, I think Richarlison is probably a move on. But I, I still have exactly what I said to you this time last week, Serge. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes and it's something like 2-2-16. Two, two, and he like he goes off against Sheffield United and he gets and he's just in the right place. Because if we create the right sort of chances for that profile of player, then who knows, you might just have a day. And I I, I do have that nagging doubt that in the Sheffield United game he might go off. But Madison clearly at the moment looks like the better option. I mean it's, it feels unquestionable. Mm. Whereas Richarlison might be that two two haul. Madison feels more like he'll be like six eight, six eight. A little bit, yeah. He's beginning to feel like that. So, I mean, he was outstanding. He was the best player on the pitch by a distance on Saturday as well. So, he played a bit of a different role as well. Um, partly because I think Bournemouth will really give teams difficulty as a pressing animal this year, actually, once they get it right, that he was trusted to go in deeper and drag people with him um, and move Bournemouth about positionally to give them headaches in terms of how they pressed. That was a bit confusing. I thought the way he adapted was really good. It he, he was outstanding, James Madison. Um, I also thought it was probably Pedro Porro's best game for Tottenham. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. His understanding of the roles come on massively when two weeks ago we were sitting here thinking, I'm not sure he can play that. And now he's come in the team somewhat fortuitously, particularly in the Manchester United game. Tottenham kept two clean sheets. And the thing with him is, he's if he was going to play, he's worth more than a doggy. Yeah, because he absolutely and he is more than a doggy, isn't he? Yeah, he's 4.9. He absolutely will get the attacking returns if he plays often enough. But it would come no, as no shock if Emerson was back in the team yeah. at the weekend. That, that's, Udogi feels a little bit safer. On uh, Destiny, um, he's fine, by the way. Many of you might have seen him limp off. And it was one of them that was quite concerning when it happened because no one was near him. But apparently, um, he stubbed his toe in the ground as he played the pass or something, and they just decided not to take a risk of him. Apparently, he wanted to carry on. It can hurt. So he should. He should be. Have you ever done it? Mm. I'm saying it's not easy. It's not painful. Is there anything worse than when you like you you know you kick the side of a wall or something when you go and you go through a door, you catch a little toe or something. How do we do that? I have no idea. Everybody does it though, don't they? Sure, everybody must know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, Destiny should be all right. As I said last week, I don't, again, I don't think it's impossible that Davis might play at Burnley or Sheffield United. But if you're on, you'd be very happy. And obviously, I think you play him in most circumstances nice. in these next couple of weeks. Um, Sonny, would, Sonny wouldn't be justifiable with the money at no. the moment. If something does happen where Perisic gets in the team, absolutely steam into him, as per what Ricky Saunders said in pre season, because it's not wing back anymore. If he plays, he plays a winger. Cool, um, and that would be really interesting. So, yeah, not perfect. I think the one real positive about Tottenham at the moment is I, I look. I've looked at all the games. I think, oh, yeah, I know you can do better than this. What was most pleasing was the way they controlled the game from the second goal. It was really good. They played with a bit of swagger and stuff. And I think most of the neutrals beginning to to enjoy watching Tottenham again. I certainly am, but not getting carried away at all. Um, next couple of games were obviously winnable. Burnley, Sheffield United. So. Yeah, there's every reason to invest in Tottenham. And I think, yes, now I would have to say Madison over Richarlison. I, I can't make an argument against that. Arsenal dropped points at home to Fulham. Didn't see this one coming at all. And not even like the fact that they managed to get themselves back in front 2-1. You'd think that they need to see out games like this. Um, I was very surprised. Very surprised that they didn't see this out. Um, Arsenal played. I was surprised that, and Ketcher was dropped as well. Ars- he'd been playing Arsenal well. Arsenal played really well for the hour in the middle, I would say. Um, but had a slug. They keep start, playing well obviously. for an hour in a game, I mean, whether it's the first hour or the hour in the middle. They got start playing for ninety minutes. Uh, I think quite often they do, and I, I think it's worth saying that nine times out of ten, if that game gets repeated in exactly the same way, Arsenal win it nine times out of ten. Honestly, I, it was one of them where. Remarkably, it's the third time that they've conceded a goal in the first minute at the Emirates in the last year. It was Bournemouth and another one that escapes me, which is bizarre. It was a beautiful assist from Bukayo Saka for Andreas Pereira's goal, who tried to, I think, bend it into the far corner, completely mishit it, and Ramsdale just ends up doing himself over, doesn't he? Um, 
they were much better when Sinchenko came on and Fabio Vieira and they switched back to the inversion from the left-hand side rather than what they'd been doing with the right. I said it was Sinchenko giving the ball away for the second goal. Arsenal don't react quick enough and then Fulham get a corner and, and equalise through the absolutely brilliant João Paulinho. More on him on a second. And obviously Adama Traore could have won it. Um, which would have been mad against the run of play. But the patrons who were watching it with me knew I was shouting again, just leave Traore up front on his own. Because Arsenal were obviously condensing and squeezing the pitch. You don't want to, you can't leave yourself 1v1 against him. That. So it would have negated Arsenal's extra man advantage. I don't know why they didn't do it. But this one breakaway happened and he's so rapping and lightning. You, you never think he's going to finish. Mm. Um, there's a potential different weapon for Fulham down the line. On Paulinho... He's, he's the best ball-winning midfielder in the league. Mm. Um, those who listen to our Sky content know we've eulogised about him for a long time. His difference, and I, yeah, he's not fantasy relevant, it is fantasy relevant because Fulham with and without him are two different teams. I'm going to Craven Cottage tonight hoping he's not playing because I just think he, he's by far and away their most important player. I think that was the case even with Mitrovic in the team last season. Obviously, he's gone now. There's every chance, obviously, they'll add another attacking player possibly this week. Uh, although, best of seen of him and his for a long time. The acrobatic effort in the first half, what a goal that would have been if he'd scored it, which would have been particularly nice as as it was at the Emirates, which is obviously where the head collision happened a couple of years ago. Yeah, Fulham with and without Paulinho. He's, he's got to be one of the most important players for any team in this league because it just gets shot to pieces when he doesn't play, basically. So him back particularly important. It, it, it began to look more like a 4-3-3 for them um, rather than a 4-2-3-1, which I thought was to compensate for the absence of Paulinho in the first two. They've stuck with it, basically, for the Arsenal game with Pereira playing a, a little bit deeper. He may now have an injury issue now, potentially, as well. Um, but it might stick, actually, for Fulham. We, we might be moving more towards a 4-3-3 than what we saw last season you're on three Arsenal at the moment yes Sal- three as Saliba, me. Martinelli and Saka they a bit hit and miss now I mean they got United but then they got Everton then they've got uh, a more difficult game then they got uh, for to be honest with you they always beat us so just so Spurs that's yeah. what it was and then they've got an easier game uh, I feel like Fulham Bournemouth, Bournemouth, oh, Bournemouth away, and so. then they got City so it's on off I think I might get rid of Martinelli like I've said already and just stick with two. Just so, ride through this period with two and then see where we go. And I then when I go back, I'll probably go back for Erdegaard instead of yeah, uh, I obviously Martinelli. watched the majority of this game. Um, a different day Martinelli returns, particularly in the first half, actually. It's interesting. I'm thinking about this week. Obviously, he goes against wan And you do think, will he get any, any turn out of that? But then fast forward to game week five and he goes to Everton against their weak right-hand side. Mm. And I think, oh... Yeah, returns potentially on game week six. He he could have. I mean, one of the knock-ons that's so interesting of Tottenham is a far deeper tactical conversation. But let's say Porro played against Martinelli, right? And I think your instinct on that is well, Martinelli would tear Porro apart. Yeah, he may well do. What's the interesting knock-on with Tottenham and what they're doing with the fullbacks, which was very much heavy with Porro doing it more than New Doggy on Saturday, is what the wide players do. Do they? Go into that area. Do they stay? Like, if you're Martinelli, what do you do? Do you hug the touchline and let him go and just wait for counters? Or or are you more fearful that Tottenham then have men advantage in central areas? And I think different teams will treat that interestingly. But something to watch out for for wide players who play against Tottenham in future weeks. And then after that, for Martinelli, is obviously the trip to Bournemouth as well. So he's not my biggest problem. I feel like he could return in any game, any time. For me, he's clear first choice. And obviously Trossard got picked ahead of Nketiah. And Ketcher might have an injury issue, by the way. Uh, and Gabriel Jesus obviously coming as a sub. Yeah. I think they'll they'll do everything they can to get Jesus ready to start against Manchester United next week, would be my take. Agreed. Could they take a view and go right Trossard rather than Martinelli against wan I don't think so, personally. So I think Martinelli stays for me. Not that I'd be overly hopeful of returns. Not Well, it's an Arsenal player. I'm not hopeful of returns any week. Saka obviously definitely stays. Um, as said, as said on some of the bits we did last week after the Palace game, I didn't think that was conclusive on the penalty situation last week. Although Odegaard looked a bit vexed about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it felt to me like maybe he'd gone up to Saka and said, "Can I take it again?" And this time Saka just went, "No." no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Vieira was really interesting when he came on. Unfortunately, 
with Kai Havertz. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if he starts and returns at the weekend, actually, because United have got a real problem with with uh, runners coming late at the moment. Um, but he slows it down too much. When you think of Arsenal at their best, everything's so fast. You must feel like it's it's unbearable trying to deal with it, particularly at the Emirates. When it goes into him, the whole thing just seems to slow down. It's a bit ponderous. And you know what? It might develop that he becomes a really good solution answer for Arsenal, but I don't think it is at the moment. I think they're better without him. And it was definitely better when Vieira came on. Stonewall penalty, unquestionably. Good assist for the second goal, which Fulham can't have complaints about Bassi being lying injury prone in the penalty area because the ball was in Leno's arms. Leno threw it out and then Arsenal won the ball back and was well within their rights to to carry on from there. Um, Yeah, I think they would be... There's two things. One, they'd be better off going back to what we know, which is Zinchenko playing and inverting off the left. And I think it's a team without habits at the moment. But you could have, you could genuinely have some joy on Sunday. Gabriel, we must talk about it. So it's now three weeks running. Three different players have got the call ahead of him. First, Timber, who we knew was going to play in fairness. But effectively, it's been Timber, Tomiyasu, now Kivio. Tomiyasu obviously comes back from suspension as well. And he's a good, very good 1v1 defender. So... It's not impossible that they could say, right, yeah, I want you to defend against an Anthony or a Rashford, for example. So if I think it's it's an interesting week for Gabriel. I wouldn't be hugely surprised if he did leave the football club. He just doesn't feel right. I, I can't be having that, even in that system, building from the right, that Kivior is a better choice for Arsenal than Gabriel. I don't understand it. He's actually a good centre-back when he gets pulled into wide areas defensively. I think his distribution is no worse than Kivior. Uh, to say the least, in my opinion. So I'm surprised. Something there's not right. If you've got, it's just a headache that's never going to go away, just sell it. Like that's quite straight. You look at United this week anyway and think, mm, what's your hopes for a clean sheet? Now, if you've still got it, it's got to go, I think. Even if even if he came back in the team, fine. It's a headache that's going to stay with you week on week. Deal with it, I think. Would you feel the same? Yeah, yeah, I would have got it done last week. I'd have got it done yeah. last week. Yeah. Right, two more games that we're going to do in the 60 second style, James, because we've been talking for ages and we still got, we've only been through three games. Uh, Brentford Crystal Palace, 1 1. Good result away for Crystal Palace. I'm not buying any of the players from any of these FPL teams, even Everton Wolves. They can go in the bin as far as I'm you concerned. You mentioned you're still in Bumo interest now. Not like if anyone owns him, you wouldn't sell him. Of course not. And if you want to go and buy him, I still think their fixtures are decent. I'm looking at him in Sky this weekend, but that's more as a daisy chain. But if I'm going off Martinelli, I don't need to go cheap. So I I can afford Madison or uh, any of the other sevens in Sterling or whatever. So I don't need to go to Mbomo. And with the fixtures, I think Sterling or something like that is a better pick coming up. But if I owned him, I'd still be keeping him. Um, but I was surprised that Brentford didn't win. Uh, there's considering no, it was at there's home. no way you would consider saying any Brentford player yeah. you've got this week. No. Nah. I thought they would do better at home, um, but uh, they didn't. Look. And, and and Palace are a difficult team to play against, so fine, 1-1. But I think they'll be upset with the goal they conceded as well. Oh, it's a bizarre it's goal. It's weird. Really weird goal. Um, I, I think if the same scenario happens several times over, I, I don't think it ever ends up in the back of the net. Really weird one where... Collins and Fleckham both just hesitated for a fraction. Anderson essentially tackles and it goes through Fleckham's legs and manages to get over the line. Bizarre goal. Great goal from Kevin Sharday to get the open. I know Tom Med was quite high on him um, in pre season. He's 5.4. Should be said, obviously, that's his first goal for Brentford, but a great goal as well. Both these teams run changed. I wouldn't be surprised if they're unchanged going into the games at the weekend as well. They've both got attractive fixtures. Obviously, Brentford at home to Bournemouth and Crystal Palace at home to Wolves. So anything you've got this week, for me, that's a Sam Johnston plays. But then there's the caveat that, because Dean Henderson, we think, is going to Crystal Palace. Right. Um, which could potentially Permanent. be a headache. Yes, 20 million is the rumoured transfer thing. Oh, okay. And there is a suggestion it might cause a bit of a transfer goalkeeper merry-go-round that could even see Johnston sold. Um, but I don't think that's the case. I would view that as... My honest opinion, I think Johnson's a better goalkeeper than Henderson, is my honest opinion. And I I'm not, I don't feel hugely under threat from that in the immediate. Maybe further down the line, yes. But I, I don't feel hugely under duress about that. Both of these clubs are looking to do business this week. Palace are looking for attacking players, definitely. Probably one extra cover defensively as well. 
And Brentford, I'm very, very confident, will buy a wide forward this week before the window starts, even if it's something that's a loan that turns into um, an obligation further down the line. So real note for that in terms of the potential impact on people like Sade and obviously Visser as well. If they buy someone who's right winger, you might get Mbumo goes through the middle, for example. So, And that will obviously appeal to Mbumo owners even more. So, yeah, consciousness. And there should be around that with a lot of teams. But it feels like that's probably the biggest takeaway from these two this week is expect both to do business in the transfer window this yeah, week. Yeah, the uh, deadline's crept up pretty fast, you know. Like the transfer deadline on Friday. I feel like Shut there's been so much day. activity happening and then suddenly it's like... It's going to be even worse in the next three days, four days. You, you know I love a Friday deadline, don't you? Mm. Oh, wow. This is going to be so much fun this Friday. I um, feel like if I'm looking for a goalkeeper, though, I'd, even like Flecken or Johnson, I'd go Ariola now, to be honest, because he's definitely first choice and he's cheap. And fixtures up or down. You know, Ariola's got 18 points this season. He hasn't kept a clean sheet. Three games, 18 points, hasn't kept a clean sheet. It's interesting. Probably won't keep one the next three. No, he might still pick up <laughs> points, right? He made nine saves at the weekend and he's 4.1 at the moment as nine it stands. Nine at the end. Was he a five-pointer he got? Uh, yeah, five-pointer. Yeah. Three-pointer in the first and ten, obviously with a penalty save against Enzo. But yeah, look, any, 18 any, points, any, no no penalties. Any, no, uh, any goalkeeper who saves a penalty in kind of the opening month for the season is always going to be near the top of the leaderboard as it works out. It's interesting. We talk about coin flips sometimes in FPL. Uh, Jockey Madison, 22 points so far this season. Mark Gay, 10 feels like it could have just easily been a flip the other way around. That's the sort of one you think, I've missed out on 12 points there. I don't regret it. What it probably means, by the way, and this is what we said with with Rory when we spoke to him in pre-season, our Palace correspondent, is with them two, and if they both stay, because there's a little bit of question marks about that as well this week, that with them, if you want to invest in the future, get the one that's going to be cheaper. Well, because of what's happened at some point in the near future, the answer to that is going to be Mark Gay. Let's talk about Everton nil, Wolves one. Um, I've uh, one of my closest friends is a Toffee. I don't even, I haven't even messaged him yet, mate. Like commiserations and stuff. But it's looking brutal. Oh, yeah, he done, mate. Um, Wolves will be very happy to get a win on the board, considering they they played well in the first game. Not so good, obviously, last week, but difficult circumstances. Um, and then Everton, this was very much a six pointer where one of them needed to get off the off the mark and get some points on the board. And Wolves getting three will be very very happy with with that, even though we know that uh, Mateusz Nunez, as the pronunciation, Nico Mateusz Nunez is on strike because uh, he wants to get his move um, to Man City. But w- Wolves, I think, uh, will, will feel happy. But Everton, I mean, this weekend's game. It's possibly it's probably the biggest game of the season so far f- for anybody, oh, isn't it? God. Are we at that time already? This where we're saying that this is like I d- I d- I don't, monster. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's going to it's clash of correspondence this week, isn't it? Sheffield United, Everton with Tomo and Sean. It's going to be interesting to say the least. I'm sure Tomo expects victory. I'm not sure what Sean's going to say. Here's two mad stats for you, Serge. So Everton's XG this season is actually just a shade under five goals. Yeah, mad. They have so underperformed. Scored none. Mm. And to be honest, if we step back, everything's kind of outcome related. I get that. But Everton could easily be on six points right now. Yeah, If they had had someone who could put the ball in the onion bag, there's every chance they'd have won two home games. But... But I know them. And scored. this is the problem. You get to the end of the season, and you look back, and all the like late goals you conceded that turn wins into draws or draws into defeats, and you start adding them up, and all the VAR decisions that go against you doesn't help because you don't put those points back on the board. I've been at the bottom of the table where you look back and you think, oh, if only we'd have just got those three or four extra points here or there, we'd feel comfortable. But you don't get those points back, man. These games are gone now. They're done. So Everton's he, trouble, here's man. a more typical Everton stat for you. Three of Wolverhampton Wanderers' last four away wins in the Premier League have been at Goodison Park. Right. That is a cracker. Three of the last four. So they've won three in like four <laughs> seasons or something. That's bad. Very bad. Which also tells us something about Wolves, by the way. But yeah, an important win. This easily could have ended up 1-0 the other way. And the draw probably would have been about right. Um Please for Kalidzic, who obviously joined and obviously had the terrible ACL injury. Mm. I liked his interview and after the getting game. Getting punched in the face by Seems, Anana as well. Uh, yes, yes, true. <laughs> uh, comes across a really likeable bloke as well. 
Jordan Pickford on the goal, though, oh, mate, it might, as well, it might as well not be there in the sense that he's 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 beyond the line when Kalidzic actually makes contact with the headers. He can't save it anyway. Mm. For for someone to get a header in from across from that angle inside the six yard box, goalkeeper has to do essentially what Anana did and come and claim everything, um, and didn't uh, and paid the price. So I think the problem Everton have got at the moment as well is, look, no one to finish the chances and you don't look at them at the moment and think, oh, they'll definitely be good enough to keep clean sheets because players, they're making individual errors. Obviously, Brantwaite coming in, I think it's the right decision. They should go with that unless they buy someone else this week because for me, that's an improvement on Michael Keane. Obviously, Lewis Dobbin played as well. We know Everton have got an agreement in place for Beto, Udinese forward. Um, so that might relieve some of the burden from an offensive perspective. My big concern for Everton isn't that they're on zero points and it isn't that I don't know if they'll do business in a transfer it's the next five for them because there's still good fixtures there with Chef United away this week. Yes, then there's, there's Arsenal. I think they go to Brentford in six. Then there's two massive home games, Luton and Bournemouth in seven and eight. If they get to the end of eight, and they're in the bottom three, I would be very, very concerned for them because, honestly, their run of fixtures looks bad for about 20 weeks after that. And I'd be really, really concerned. So I think this is a huge period for Everton. Um, by the way, I think there's every chance they probably will get something at Bramwell Lane at the weekend. Uh, I, I don't think... I wouldn't feel that confident. I don't think we're looking at these two for anything, particularly in FPL. Branthwaite and, and Dobbin, because they've got starts and are at bottom prices, are two players maybe worth keeping an eye on that you could possibly dip into towards the end of that good run, I suggested. Uh, I know a few people gambled Ray and 8 Nori this week. Probably surprised to see Hugo Bueno in the team. I'm not quite sure what the reasoning of, for that was all of a sudden. Because 8 Nori, I thought, particularly played really well at Old Trafford. I didn't see as much of the Brighton game. Uh, Huang came in for Nunes, who was obviously suspended anyway. He's picked up a hamstring injury. Uh, Pedro Neto played from the right-hand side and has looked a little bit more like his old self, but that doesn't mean we should invest in him for FPL. Um, big win for Wolves. Manchester United 3, Forest 2. After going 2-0 up, you're thinking, what's going on here? Um, I've spent the first three weeks of the season thinking, well, United can't be that bad they'll get better. United can't be that bad. They'll get better. Um, just having a little bit of faith in Eric Ten Hag, like I tipped them to finish third to me and making me look like a mug right now. Um, again, to go 2-0 down. Now, they did come back. 2-0 down, 3-2 up. United are going to win the cup. Maybe not. Uh, they did come back. Bruno did come good. And and like we'd said all week, like if you own a Bruno Rashford, you hold for that for that game against the, against Forest. Helped by the fact that they went to, down to 10 men, Forest, no doubt. But I'm not looking at any of my United assets saying, yay, I'm so glad I own Rashford um, and Onana. No, I was, they'll, they'll stay there. They're not going anywhere. I was very Fine, strong in my opinion about Fernandes and Rashford and not selling them this week. If you want to move that on now, then fine I think probably the conclusion to draw from the first three games is that actually yes at the moment Bruno Fernandes would would look the, the better option I think his most big chances created in the Premier League and I think third for key passes I might have that the wrong way around um, underline okay but then we probably would have expected that in three good offensive fixtures for Manchester United and as much as Everton could be on six United could be sitting here right now on zero they could also be sitting there on nine because you could say they're unlucky at Tottenham. So there's inconsistencies there. Yeah. Even with, maybe not the results, but even within the performances, there's inconsistencies. The best they've played this season is probably to the back end of the first half at Tottenham in game week two. And that's the game that they got beat. So a few changes. Obviously, Shaw's out for a little while. Dallow covered at left back. Please don't be selling Bakaya Saka this week. I'm sure you won't be. Uh, obviously, Ericsson came into the team, which helps control a little bit, but I'd be worried about Ericsson playing against Arsenal's midfield runners on Sunday. Obviously, Marshall came in the team, so Rashford went into his more favoured position on the left, which is obviously where he's he's then got his two assists from, one the cross for Ericsson, and uh, two, obviously, the win of the penalty, which is dubious, I would say, but he's never going to get overturned because there is contact on that. So, yeah, Rashford might go for me this week. I, I tell you my consciousness with Rashford... He's, you look in front of you and you go Arsenal away, Brighton at home. 
I don't think I should be that concerned about Brighton at home in terms of offensive assets. Brighton's XGC is not great either. Look at what West Ham posted with 20% of the ball at the weekend. Mm. So a player like Rashford on the counter-attack can certainly have some joy if they get that right. And he scored at the Emirates last year. Um, and I don't think he's got a terrible historical record against Arsenal. If Arsenal did uh, decide to persist with Thomas Partey at, uh, right back, if you will, moving inside, then Rashford versus him 1v1 when United have the ball, he's going to have some joy in that draw as well. So there's reasons to keep, but it's more looking beyond the next two, which look rough, he's then a really good run kind of starts again. So again, I, I, he's a problem for me, but I don't think he's my biggest one. I think he probably stays. I'm very conscious as well with Rashford's at the top end of the pricing, right? So if we just exclude Kevin De Bruyne from the game for the moment, then it's it's Salah and then it's sort of Son and Rashford, right? Mm. Son right now... It, look, he, he could go off in the next two because of the fixtures, but he's not an option. I'm conscious that if I start moving this about, and I could do the sort of move this week, so where I go like Rashford to Sterling and Garnacho to Foden for a minus four, and on the face of it, that sort of thing looks great. I am conscious then that the, um, the highest priced player I've got is at Saka's level and the rest I've got is beneath. So that when I do want to get, I've, I've not just shut myself off Salah, I've then shut myself off of back to Rashford and Son as well. Yeah, but you've got plenty well. of money in the bank. Con- it's only if you spend it elsewhere. Yeah, but if I, that's what I'm saying. If I spend it elsewhere. Where are you going to spend it? Salah's yeah, the only I place might. I can see that you want to go. Might. I might spend it. I, you know, Jao Pedro mm. to a 7.5 forward. Uh, Rico Lewis to like a trip here. Yeah, I might spend it. So I'm just conscious of that. So I think, I won't promise it, but I think Rashford will probably hold on for me um, at the moment. Rafael Varane went off with an issue at half time as well. Uh, Victor Lindelof, when he's covered over the last six months or so, I think he's done pretty well, actually. But yeah, they've got a big problem in midfield with runners running beyond them. They're going to get their own talking tactics this week because there's off-the-ball problems that against Arsenal you could get annihilated. Uh, Brighton won the greatest team in the country that they are and hold title on, contenders. Hold on, hold on. before you get into West Ham, Go on. how many years scored seven games in a row? Yeah, yeah. I was just looking at Forest fixtures. Chelsea, Burnley at home is decent, but then some Man City, Brentford, so, Palace. You, you, you said about money yeah. in the bank. I've got a Henderson Turner rotation in goal at the moment, right? And that's Perfectly reasonable. Johnson Turner. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I've preempted that Henderson's coming in. Johnson yeah. and Turner in goal. Yeah. And that's fine. The reason I went that route is because it looks really good for longer term. Should we begin to consider things like Eze and Awanye as a rotation? As in having more money tied up in your bench well, just rotation? Because sure. Go back what you're saying about having more money in the back. Should we begin to think about that sort of thing? Yeah, especially if it's short term. I don't think you, you don't want to plan that sort of thing over like ten weeks or so. But over really short term, if you look at sort of Palace Forest fixtures over sort of like the next six up to about game week nine, like it's really good in terms of what fixture you'd get out of that. So you could bench out when he when he goes to Manchester City, for example, etc., or Chelsea this week, and you've got Eze at home to Wolves, and then it's someone decent in six instead. Would you consider that sort of thing? I don't think it's for me, but I think. We may have to adapt our thinking this year in FPL where this sort of thing becomes an option. I think that for a lot of us, eight or nine out of our 11 are exactly the same. And it's only two or three players where you're finding your difference. And if that's your tactic for your two or three different players is you use them on rotation and cycle through some six and a halfs and sevens. Then, then go for it. Like You could also go do the opposite, which is completely thin out your bench and just pick three better players. I don't think it's a bad shout. You are reliant on timing and picking the fixtures and playing it well, but I don't think it's a bad shout. We all need to find a way of finding two, three, four differential players in amongst the eight, nine uh, template players that we have. So, yeah, I I think it's okay. If, and I certainly won't be, but if I was wildcarding this week and subject to what the two clubs do in the transfer window, I would very much consider doing that with Edouard and now when you're here at the moment. Just for a little bit. Okay. There'll be people saying, what are you leaving now when you're out for? Seven consecutive games scored in now, mate. Anyway, off you go. Go on, talk about your Well, your talking about top of the league, title West Ham. Um, oh, Bright and other title challengers, mate. <laughs> We've been talking about it on this show and they got humbled. 
No, only you were they talking about humbled. it. Humble. You were talking about it because I mentioned it at the back end of last so you, season. When you mentioned it, you talked about it. I also said if they kept their team together and McAllister and Casado really looked like a miss for the first they time on gone. Saturday. Um, yeah, very, very uh, interesting. I felt very confident going into the game. Um, you were pissed. Optimistic, I would say, more than confident, actually. He'd, he'd it just felt like I'd had two or three, not that it's many. enough for you. Yeah, mate. Um, <laughs> And uh, and the game played out like if you look back from a stats point of view, I mean Brighton ended up having twenty five shots, ten on target, but only an xG of one and a half, which goes to show the quality of the chances wasn't particularly great. If you look back at it, and I did look back at the highlights, they did dominate the ball for such and large. A parts lot of, of the them game. good ones were at three nil and three one, right? Yeah, that's so. true. When they were pushing right towards the end, and they did play some decent football, um, but other than Mitoma. Nobody felt like a threat that would, would be the live wire that would break us down. Mitoma is one of those players that whenever he gets the ball, you think, shit's going to happen now. He's like, okay, what's he going to do? He gets you on the edge of your seat. And you, as a, as a player playing against them, you get fearful when Mitoma gets the ball. But when the likes of March and uh, Gross and even when it was going into Ferguson and that, yeah, they were okay. But you never felt really particularly threatened which is similar to the Chelsea game but whereas when you flip it the other way when we attacked it was much more incisive and you felt like oh there's a there's a uh, a threat there but we didn't attack a lot like first half one shot on target wasn't it in the entire for half I mean I'd, I'd sent a screen grab at half time on, on the Twitter account oh, Bonner's average position in the first yeah. half was nearly in line with Ariola was staggering but I also added to that as well that the tactics were very much working. Yeah. So on our differential show on Patreon, do you want to tell everyone what you predicted the Three score would be time. on Friday? And, Three, and, and, and what did I do? Uh, you laughed. <laughs> I did. But the thing is, right, is, is uh, uh, when we were playing, particularly in the first half and just camped in, it was as if we'd done a whole week's training of how we're going to play football without the ball. And that was it. We were just like, fine, we're going to play football but we're not interested in winning the ball back. We'll just do everything else around it. You, and we were really good. With that prediction, Jaron, what the caveat I said was when I laughed, though, I said you were arguably the best equipped team to, to go play there and beat them. them. Well, people are going to look at West Ham very differently now um, because we've proven defensively we're very stubborn and hard to, hard to break down. We haven't kept a clean sheet, but we've only leaked one goal in each of those games. Um, and they've been decent goals. Like... Uh, Bournemouth's goal was okay after we were one up. Uh, every game, actually, we've conceded after we've been leading, which is interesting. Um, Brighton, disappointment. But I wouldn't actually be selling Estupinan or Mitoma or March or even Pedro. I wouldn't be looking to sell any of them. Yeah, Pedro. What's interesting about Pedro is a good reason to wait. Here's, here's another good example for you. The player that was picked instead of João Pedro at the weekend, considering we knew that Evan Ferguson would start, He's very injury prone. And unfortunately, Julio Insisto is out long term as well. And we might get to the weekend and it might look like, well, it has to be Pedro and, and Ferguson. And then even then, just by virtue of playing, even though it's Newcastle at home at the weekend, I think I probably want to start him again. Yep. And then it stays and it's not so much of a problem on my mind anymore. So, uh, but it looks, it looks to me like he was obviously unhappy with stuff from the Luton game. Um, and it feels like he's sending a bit of a message at the moment in terms of what he wants from him off the ball and stuff. This was another game. It's not to take anything away from you, Serge, or, or say that you, you didn't deserve the victory. Could have gone the other way. Absolutely. That's, Could have gone that, the other that's, way. That's, that's all I was going to say. Yeah. Their 68 penalty area touches was the second most of a team in the Premier League that has lost a game since Opta started keeping these records in 2008. Uh, for the record, the, the other one was Manchester City in a game in the Manchester derby, ironically, actually. So it's not like they weren't entering the penalty box, etc. But you stood very, very firm. And there's possibly something we should remember when Manchester City go to Westfield Shopping Centre in game week five as well. Um, the slight difference between City and Brighton, of course, is you can just hang across into the box and Holland might well do what he did yeah. against Sheffield United on, on Sundays. That, whereas Brighton don't have that in quite the same way. Not that Danny Welbeck can't, but it's obviously not quite. If Holland gets in front or off you, then you're finished, you know that. So, yeah, I don't think it's not... Um, it's not slit your wrist for Brighton at all, but there should be a consciousness now that this has now happened twice. The Everton game and this. The Everton game was quite similar. Yep. And well, the Everton were winning the ball back much higher up. No. No? 
I thought Everton were trying to nick the ball uh, when Brighton were in transition think, and then getting um, straight into their back four. Everton were far quicker to get runners forward on the counter, but most of the time they won the ball back was on the edge of their own area. Mm. With yours, it was a little bit slower, certainly until you had sort of second goal. Uh, Everton well deserved to beat Brighton that day. The, the cautious on that, by the way, as well, is what did Brighton do after that Everton game? They went to the Emirates and won 3-0. Mm. And that's something Newcastle should be conscious of this week, that they'll be working doubly hard to correct that this weekend. But to go back to, yes, you know, talk of them win the title and stuff, unfortunately, I think inconsistencies are still going to remain. And I do think that little bit of extra quality with a McAllister Casado, it, at certain times of the weekend, it did stand out that it was missing a little bit, I thought. So... Look, they're obviously a very good team. Everybody who listens or watches us regularly knows what I think of them, but you may still get these inconsistencies in some of these fixtures like this. And you are arguably the best set team to do that sort of thing Mm. and actually come out of it and still somehow fucking enjoy it. (laughs) Yeah, and I think from an FPL point of view, there's a few West Ham players that put their hat in the ring now. I think Ariola already was, just by virtue of being 4.0 goalkeeper. Um we didn't. We were missing our best centre back in Aged, but be back Friday. Yeah, and uh, Zuma Aged is the threats from set pieces uh, for sure. Even Alvarez is a threat from set pieces, he and was he great. came on and played he was really, really well. good. There was that moment in the second half where he was so cool in the penalty box on the ball. Really good. JWP at six million. I'm not saying Alvarez is FPL by no, the way, not at all, but not JWP at all. is definitely um, worth looking at at six million. I think he'll tick along nicely. Uh, I think Bowen back to his best at 7 million. He looks lively. He's getting shots off, which he wasn't before, um, which is particularly good. Today, hopefully, they will announce a price for Mohamed Kudus. Mm. Um, Where does he come in now? This is... This, the, who knows? Ben Rama would have to be an avoid at the moment. Correct, he? yeah. Just did, because did he lost his place at the weekend. He the most pass of any West Ham player in the game. Really? Which is, considering he came, came on. Came on at half surprising. an hour when, when Socek was injured. I'm not sure. I've got a inkling that they want to play Kudus up top. I think in FPL will come in as a midfielder and I think he'll come in at six and a half. But you I think, think he'll... So play. you think it'll take Antonio's place? Yeah. Oh, maybe not straight away. I mean, Anto- maybe Antonio that's the intention. at six... Is he only six million in FPL? I right, ignored yeah. him completely in FPL, but he is at six million. He's not bad. He's not bad. But I think Kudus would be one to look at as well. Let's move to Sunday though, James, because we have still got three games to talk about. Burnley one, Aston Villa three. I've been reserving judgment on Burnley because Man City opening there the season. Villa is also a tough game, um, but now they're zero from two. Yeah, look, again, two really tough games and they've got another one against my team on Saturday as well. Um, Can the journalist covering Burnley, can you do better, please? (laughs) Like, seriously. I was just going around in circles trying to get information on team news and all I could find was something official on Burnley's website on Friday was about, uh, oh, yeah, no news. Was there no no presser? No no news. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was a presser and then there wasn't a lot of information out of it, so I don't know if it wasn't asked about injuries or whatever. To be fair, Burnley had put out a statement out on their website earlier in the day saying no new injuries. What I wanted to find out for people was for Jordan Bayer, right? Mm. Who I presumed wasn't someone that people wanted to start this week, but did want to know his injury status in case they wanted to make transfers like to Gusto, for example. Nothing. Found out yet later on Sunday, yep, hamstring strain, probably not back till game week five. So won't be available this week against Tottenham again. You probably weren't starting it, but if you started with him, that's a disappointing one. One to keep an eye on, though. Every chance he'll come back in. Bernie played, uh, from what I've seen of this, which isn't a lot, looked like essentially a roundabouts of 4 4 2. Obviously, they'd played kind of a 5 2 3 against Manchester City. And this was with Connor Roberts moving back to right back and inverting into central midfield positions. He gave a debut to Hannes De Croix at left back. It's not a player I know very well. Manuel Benson came in on the right hand side of midfield, which meant Kolioshu moved to the left hand side. Um, Gave away chances too easily would probably be the big takeaway. And a, another one who, when you look at some of the goals conceded already, you think, oh yeah, midfield runners coming onto them might be a problem. And he does make me think about matters more and more. Also, by the way, we didn't speak about Pap Sar. He's the best 4.5 million midfielder in the game at the moment. Mm. If, if if you're going four in midfield, that's your fifth midfielder. 
He's the one you want. He probably won't start every game, but when he does, he's capable of getting returns. I wouldn't be surprised if he knocked up another one on Saturday, actually. Um, so a little bit of concern. It's probably an adaptation period here for Burnley. They're going to have a lot of the ball, I think, in games. Like when they go to Forest in game week five, I think you'll be surprised. I think they'll have about 65% of the ball, for example. It's a Sky conversation to come back to. So. Uh, for Villa, Carlos in for Bailey. And the general feeling straight off, off seeing that was it's a back three for Villa. And I dived into our Villa Slack channel and said, I don't think it is. I think that will just be Matty Cash right at midfield. And if you look at average positions, you're probably going to come to the conclusion it was a back three. I don't think it was. I think this was still a 4-4-2. I think Matty Cash played right at midfield. And he's obviously scored twice. That is very, very appealing. Caution. I, I just don't big, know if it's reliable, is big, it? Big caution on a couple of things. One, um, obviously, Bailey didn't play and it might have had a minor issue. Obviously, Zanillo's joined the squad. He can also play that position. Longer term, I think Villa want to get back to this moving forward with the, the left-back advancing, which is very much what Luca Dean did in this situation. Ezri Kantz played as very defensive right-back that then formed into a back three within possession, uh, possession but from a starting back four base. So left back bombing on. Alex Marino, we think, could be back game week five. So again, real caution on Luca Dean. We also know Villa are potentially looking at adding a left back in the transfer window this week. If Cash stays right midfield, yeah, you are going to want it. But I would I would honestly watch and wait at the moment. I wouldn't have any confidence that that's going to stick at all. If they're insistent on on playing this same way, which really moves into a back five off the ball when the other team has dominant spells of possession and obviously Cash will drop in deep. And we've seen Villa do this into a back six uh, in certain fixtures under Unai Emery, particularly against some of the top teams. They did it very well against Newcastle in April last year. Then Cash could be good to go, but I would not go steaming in there. What do you if, think about Diaby? If you're Diaby? on, great, but... The RB, yeah, one very much to watch. And it's, all, it's worth saying. Liverpool, I, I Palace, know. Chelsea, Brighton. Four tough fixtures yeah, now for exactly them. exactly that. But then it gets better. Wolves, yes. West Ham, Luton, Forest. That, that. And so the message... Wild card the, point. The message, I think, the message I think would, would be with Villa players at the moment, whatever you've got, keep and continue to assess it. I think it's still a wait. Mm. I know we would laugh at Liverpool and stuff like, oh, there's no Van Dijk this week now and all that jazz. But old fire... We're going to dive into Villa before Liverpool away. As you said, Chelsea weighing six is potentially going to be a very different kind of game to what Villa had there in April now. Brighton seven. Yeah, for the offensive, it might be right. But then even Palace isn't one. You look at Palace at home in five, you think, I'll oh, probably win that one nil or something, don't you? Mm. That's the sort of vibe you have. So I wouldn't go diving in. I think Diaby is absolutely, should be on everybody's watch list at the moment. You go to Wolves in eight, and then there's a really, really good run after that. So you could argue it starts in game week eight. And you're going to want some of Villa for that. My decision on Ollie Watkins right now is he's staying up to that. Sheffield United 1, Man City 2. Another clean sheet wipeout for one of the bigger teams that we thought we could bank on. Maybe in Sky as well as uh, FPL. Did you buy a few? <laughs> what, Man City, yeah, I bought four Man City players on Sunday. No, well, Rodri More came tomorrow. in with the goal and, and phone. But yeah, look, they did. Or they did they, they got the result in the end. But they didn't keep the clean sheet, which is particularly frustrating. Foden plays his best game in a Man City shirt mm. against Newcastle. How can Pep drop him now? He, he had a kebab, didn't he? He might have. He might have had a chicken might, kebab might or a bit of Jack. lamb donna. Maybe Jack paid. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't get to start the game. but we'll, we'll never know. But I mean, Guardiola absolutely eulogised about his performance against Newcastle, as would as did we. And I, yeah, I think he would have played. Yeah, and look, if... Uh, Holland scores the penalty. That was at Alvarez's assist, wasn't it? I think Alvarez put the ball in. It as would well. have been, yes. We're looking at a very, very different score. And if I'd said to you, Holland's going to get a penalty, you'd say, yeah, well, 99 percent he's going to score it or nine. Uh no, I would have said I would have said about seventy five percent. Is that what his statistics are? Well he's he is human. Well, is he? Yeah. Rumours. Rumours. Um but yeah, they've done all right it, in the it end. Dawned, it dawned on me the other day. Do you remember do you ever watch the old Ghostbusters films? Yeah. You know the one that came out the painting? Yeah. Vigo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, 
Any takeaways from here? I mean, City are City, yeah, they're still lots. good. Um, we saw something really we haven't seen much from Manchester City in terms of no one specifically stepping out from defensive line into midfield line. This was a, a flatter system, if you will, which did allow kind of what we saw against Newcastle, although I think less emphasised just because Sheffield United were very much obviously in a low block, was obviously Carl Walker pushing on down the right-hand side, played more as a wing-back than full-back. City probably wished towards the end of the game that he wasn't playing back at all. Um, with Grealish obviously holding the left touch line, Bernardo Silva coming into the central areas, kind of starting from a four-two-three-one base, moving into a three-four-three with a with a diamond, which gives City real domination in obviously the midfield area. And look, in a different day they win that three-four-nil. League One Wes did quite well in goal for Sheffield United. Um, City kind of their sloppiness with like Walker's moment. I love the fact that he tried to hide behind the goal. What was he thinking? He's just had a brain fart. It was worth saying, though, he drove City straight up the pitch immediately and you could feel the intensity and the urgency completely return to City instantly. Alvarez nearly scored straight from that Walker run from kickoff. And then, obviously, they've, they've got the goal, to be honest, fairly early on. Where they've just raise the intensity I think the thing for City would be to probably reflect on a game like this and say if you start with that intensity you go 2-3-0 up you kill it and then you really can take the piss mm. um, and they do fall into this trap of losing that intensity sometimes there was a, a switch went off as soon as Sheffield United scored the desperation actually yep. to go and win the game for Sheffield United like really good like they, they dealt with it as well as they could um, played basically kind of a, a 3 5 one, one, which obviously ended up with more like a, a back five rather than a back three. Uh, Gustavo Hamer played a, a little bit deeper. Ben Osborne went in the team at left wing back because Max Lowe's got an injury issue and obviously Osborne himself got injured. Uh, so LaRucci came on and, and played left wing back. They've obviously added Cameron Archer to the squad, 4.5 forward, and I still think those who are on I think you're in the right position would be the go-to of the 4.5 forwards for me because I'm pretty confident he will get in that team um, if you were a Bulldog owner Serge would you play him this week it's obviously subject to what other defenders you've got but just how do you feel about the idea of that no. Bulldog versus Everton depends whether you want to talk about the Everton that haven't scored a goal yet this season or the Everton that have got an XG of over 5 this season which narrative do you want I wouldn't play him Depends what you've got, yeah, right? exactly. But if I was owning Bulldog, he'd be uh, would, in place would, of Kibore, he'd be my fifth over, defender. No, would you pick him over a Saliba? No, I think I would this week. Woof. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just on the, it's edge, just on the nah. fixtures. Yeah, I uh, don't have much faith it's in just them. on the fixtures, and they've not looked terrible defensively. We have to say that, right? It looks all right. They haven't won anything think, yet. I, by the way, I think it's a bigger game for Sheffield United. As I said, it's a really big run for Everton. I think it's a bigger game for Sheffield United because it gets worse for them after this week as well. So, yeah, I think Bulldog obviously is back fit and available. We'll, we'll probably stay in the team most games at right wing back. Um, although, obviously, Jay Bogle did get the goal. Um, and Archer, I think, will get in the team. So, Archer's a really interesting one to follow for future weeks. Kind of an ideal eight for attacker, if you will to leave on the bench every week going forward. I do think he'll get into that team and I do think he'll be quite interesting at 4.5. Agree, yeah. Uh, for if City, I was wild carding, I mean, he'd be in. Just the, just one more note, obviously, Akanji didn't play, little nigger as well, and he'd been moving into midfield from centre-back last few games. And interestingly, Aki played left-sided centre-back uh, when Gvardiol played left-back. I think that means Gvardiol's gotten a nod on Aki most games. It's obviously not 100% with City. But I think if they want to do that with Akanji back in going into midfield, it was interesting. He, he wasn't comfortable putting any of the others to do that job. So I think it would be Aki as it stands would be the one that missed out if Akanji comes back in. So those who have gone Gvardiol, I think it'd be all right. I think he's quite he's 5.1 now. I think it's pretty interesting. Cool. Last but not least, Newcastle 1, Liverpool 2. Uh, firstly, thank you to Trent Alexander-Arnold for getting a yellow card and a one-pointer because it made my transfer him out all the more satisfying. He could have got, got your red card and made it even easier. Yeah, possibly. possibly. Um, Newcastle's going to be hugely disappointed because to go for them to go down to 10 men, to be in the lead 1-0 and to be pl 
playing better and dominating the game, again, you want to be able to kill it and finish it off. And this whole transition period of, of making it from the pretenders into the top six or, or, or Champions League contenders, they've lost to City and Liverpool back to back in two weeks. And it just kind of brings you back down to earth a little bit when they have been doing and playing so well after the win on the opening day of the season. No panic stations here for Newcastle. Just, I would say, a bit of disappointment and perhaps a little bit of uh, back to reality and knowing what hard work it's going to take to to get them up there. Um, But Darwin Nunez, if we've given him grief for some stuff, finishing is definitely one of them. (laughs) He buried both of them. Brilliant goals. That was at the point I was like, okay, you know what? that you can finish. Like, you just hit the target, you can finish. And um, it was the striker that we thought they'd bought, right? They were they were both well taken, but smacked of a player in confidence. If I knew it was going to start Saturday, I'd come by him. Really? Yeah, without hesitation. Who are they playing again? Villa at home. Ooh. His goals record is good. He's, yeah, he's he just well, well underperformed his it's XG last player. year. Obviously, on a day like Sunday, he's obviously well overperformed it. I'm absolutely convinced that Liverpool will do much better with him up front. I think his chaos creates space for others. Um, and I think it will do really well. When me and Clayton did the piece in pre season about which player did we, we think would, would kind of which player Breakthrough would really season for second have season, a better yeah. second season and improve, we were both unanimous Darwin Nunes top of that list. If, if Klopp's come out and said, yeah, Nunes starts Saturday, I'd buy him. Who would you sell? Jao Pedro. Okay. Just, I'm just go right, I'm commit to that. That's where I'm going. Mm. Um, and get, get that ready for for later on and obviously the fixtures in front because well, it's Wolves 5 West Ham 6 it's Tottenham away Brighton away 7 and 8 and then that really good run begins in game week 9 and, and I know obviously he's not going to play all those games but at that value yeah I think he could be brilliant but I'm not going I'm not going there if I don't think he's going to start and I wouldn't have no clue at the moment they did start with with Gakpo false 9 which I, they picked the team that I predicted they would on the team news uh, stream the deadline stream which didn't have Jota in it because I thought they would. I thought that they would play. I thought it was every chance. I should say that Trent would play as a more orthodox right back, and they would try and box around Gomez, which meant having Gakpo plus one of the eights on either side, plus Endo and uh, another one bit deeper. So they played McAllister in a more advanced role, and Sabosli kind of sat in a bit more. I didn't watch all this game, to be totally honest, but that's how they tried to set up. So Jota could very easily come back in the team for the Villa game as well. Was Jota's not done anything particularly wrong in the first couple. It was it was a tactical tweak. It was the reason he came out of the team. Um, but obviously, I, I was at Wembley Saturday. Shout out to my friend Callum Mates and friends from Romania. I had a really good day Sunday at Wembley. Thank you. Obviously, I, I was travelling there. I knew that Newcastle were winning and, and Van Dijk had been sent off. When Callian said to me, uh, to me, I forgot about the game, to tell you the truth, because I just thought, well, Newcastle win comfortably from here. It was almost the side that I would trust the most to to go on See and finish out. that off and arguably win quite comfortably. When Callian told me that Liverpool had won, I couldn't believe it. I literally said to him, you're lying. Couldn't believe it. So, look, we've given Newcastle a lot of praise over the last couple of years. They have to take some criticism here for not finishing that off. Because you want to be a top side, you get yourself in those sort of positions you've got to because Newcastle started the game really well in any case. Go and finish it off. It just because Liverpool went down a ten, it just it maybe it's similar to what we just said about City. Just like a little bit's like the intensity level stepped off. It felt like watching bits of the game back, it felt like the, the crowd kind of eased off a little bit in atmosphere. It became more of a, an expectancy rather than anticipation, if you will. Um and that, that is a blow to lose like that. Admittedly, Nunes' two finishes are weldy. They're proper good finishes. And he probably doesn't take either of those chances this time last year. I I think he's a top forward, Serge, and I'd be really interested in getting him. Sven Botman is a doubt, as you'd mentioned earlier. And if he's missing for the Brighton game, that spells trouble. So I'll go Pedro to Nunes. Nunes won't start. Pedro will. Pedro will go mad because Botman's injured. This is sort of trailer this is what happens in your FPL mind when you start thinking about things um, Newcastle have a good run that kind of starts game week 5 but then that's also down to how we interpret that because it's Brentford at home is that where does that fall in line we know no, Bre- if it's, Brent- it's Brent- St James's it's Brent- a good yeah but Brentford will go to Newcastle they'll change it up they'll go 5 three, two. we already know that they'll change it up so maybe it starts in 6 when they go to Sheffield United 
Isak's right on radar. Uh, Trippier is obviously Botman, to be fair, at his price bracket. He probably if if they'd have not started if they'd have started with easier fixtures, most of us would have ended up starting with him. His ownership would have been huge at the start of the season, and I think we should now keep an eye on Anthony Gordon at five point five. Okay, if he's going to play there regularly, he's a threat. He took the goal well, he gave Liverpool a lot of lot of trouble um, in the first half. Trent was obviously really unlucky with the first yellow card or the yellow card he did get, but was then lucky not to get the second yellow. The Van Dyke red. Did you think it was a red? Yeah, I I can't make my mind up on it. To tell you the truth, he kicks through. He does. He takes him out. Yes, and if he didn't, Isak would be in on goal with a shooting opportunity. One on one. It also came across as a genuine attempt to win the ball. My understanding so was. My understanding he wiped was him out. He didn't really wipe him out. He swung through and took him out. It was a red. It was a red. Firstly, was it a I'm foul? Not sure. Was it a foul? Yeah. Was he last man? But I also was think... Was he last man? I also think that there's no way... Is that a yes? If he was the, last if man. If the referee would not seen it, yes, he was. So there we go. It's a foul and he's last man. It's a red card. But he's fouled him and then he stopped the ball. Who stopped the ball? Van Dyke. Yeah, but you still fouled so him. So how... F- all I'm saying is how far away was he? It's, what do you draw the line at? No, I'm just, foul's a foul. I'm just It's saying. a red card. It's unfortunate. Sometimes you... Do, you it's um, it, it, it's a bit unfortunate, but if, it is what it is. If the referee hadn't given the decision on the pitch, there is no way VAR sent him over. No, I think they would have, because he kicked nah. through, because contact. No, nah, I don't think so. Yeah, I, for me, that was one where there was not much doubt. Like, it's, it's on the softer end of red cards, but it was a foul because he took him out and he was the last man. Isak was in with a chance to shoot on goal. So, but, and only the keeper to beat, I think it's got to be given. That's a great spot on the field that it was given as a foul. Because yeah. I think most, when I first saw the incident, I thought he's won the ball down. Yeah, maybe. So it was a good spot from the referee. I can't remember who was refereeing, to be totally honest. Uh, Luis Diaz as well, 7.7. I wouldn't rule it out. out. He had a specific job. Obviously, he was hooked quite early against Newcastle, partly because of, well, actually, almost definitely because of the red card. But he had a specific job to go quite deeper against Kieran Trippier as well. He was doing fine. And uh, he's back to full fitness, I think. So Diaz at 7.7 is, is a name I won't rule out this week as well. But he's more one to keep an eye on. And in terms as well, Sid, in terms of thinking about holding that money back for, say, Salah for that brilliant run, I'm thinking about it more and more and asking, well, can I go down the route of things like Diaz and Nunes instead and Jota even, mm. rather than forcing in Salah and having to break the structure and stuff? And that might be what I decide to do is go with sort of two or three like that and just go, right, it will be what it will be on the rotation. But I know there'll be contributions across the board here. Yep. Okie doke. Uh, James, that's a wrap of the games. Uh, do you want to tell everybody what they got to look forward to for the rest of the week? Uh, I've had a look at some of the questions in on Twitter, but we have been going long. I have no idea what it it's is. It's not as long as you think because Nico was recording ages before we started. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, Five minutes, he said. Okay. Add it on. Don't, uh, don't do a five-minute intro, yeah. Nico. Well, tell us what we've got to look uh, forward Sky to this Fantasy week. tomorrow. I'll be streaming. I'll stream, stream on Thursday, uh, Friday. Be out early for you because obviously it is a Friday deadline. Clash of Correspondent says, Sheffield United versus Everton. No, it's not an FPL podcast. Um, it's already a six-pointer podcast, I think, even at this stage of the season. I'll be out for you early on Friday. Deadline stream uh, is almost definitely going ahead, by the way. I did say last week I wasn't sure. I'm almost definitely getting the coach to Burnley on Saturday, so it'll almost definitely go ahead 5.30pm on our YouTube channel. If you want to support the show, it's www.patreon.com forward slash Planet FPL. Uh, we've got a QA and a today, Tottenham tomorrow, a bit of reaction to Tottenham's performance tonight, as well as the good fun we had on Saturday, which was good fun. Uh, Thursday, Clayton's joining me for the transfer window show. We'll have our game week four preview on Friday. I think Clayton's joining me for that one as well. And advanced tier content includes unanswered cues today, away days tomorrow, Thursday, talking tactics on Manchester United's off the ball problems at the moment, and the team news stream on Friday as well. Lovely jubbly. If you want to support the show and get that additional content, patreon.com forward slash planet FPL, where you can come and join a community of over 700 engaged fantasy managers, whether it's FPL, whether it's Gaffer, whether it's Sky. We've got prize leagues. We've got all the additional podcasts. We've got channels about each and every competition. Um, and yeah. We've- also, you don't have to wait for the start of the month anymore. Oh, okay. You can just sign up anytime so if you, you want. If you sign up now, I don't know what the date is. 28th, is it? 28th? Yep. 
you sign up on the 28th, you sign up today, you get billed on the 28th next month. So there's none of that anymore where you might get done twice in a week or anything like that. You get billed monthly from the date that you join. Uh, there is one more uh, thing to announce before you do the questions, Suj. Uh, we have a new correspondent. Uh, many of you might have heard or seen Lauren Harris join me for a couple of previews of the Women's World Cup. Uh, love Lauren. Uh, contributions absolutely outstanding in terms of her knowledge of women's football and support for the game. We'd like to do more women's football stuff. That doesn't mean we're doing a show every week or anything like that, but we, we want to do more. Lauren will be joining me for a Women's Super League preview in a few weeks as well because that starts up, I want to say, first weekend of October so Lauren will be a regular guest for us when we cover stuff on on women's football nice and she's in slack as well if anyone wants to chat you just join Patreon she's also a really nice Liverpool fan Scouser which means I've got two correspondents she's not a Scouser but Liverpool fans and nice oh wow Uh, yeah who can take criticism Um, Well, well done on Sunday Reds nice we had a few people sign up in the last week James Andrew Callanan welcome to Patreon are you just shouting people out now? People are joining the last week. Matthew Greco. You just sh- what, what, Why are you doing this randomly? Yeah, every You've week. Decided- if, you jo- if you sign up to Patreon, oh. I'm going to give you a shout out for joining. And Noel. Noel Brennan. Do you know Noel is? Did house party. He did do <laughs> house party. Right. Questions on the Bird app. <sighs> Go on in. If we must. Go on in. Triple Captain Archer says FPL Calypso. Yeah, yeah, great. Wicked, yeah. This week or when? Uh, no, when they play. Who have they got game week five? You're them away game week five. Okay, game week five, Triple Captain. And yeah. we want photographic evidence that you're serious yeah. about your question. Yeah. Because he did say in brackets afterwards, being serious, by the way. What you want with Archer is you want him to play in the Carabao this midweek to give you something that you think that will start at the weekend. Not from a triple camp, see, obviously not. But he's, he's another one we mentioned about Bulldog starting. Could you do that with Archer this week as well? There's more of a temptation for that even more, isn't there? Surely, if you think he's going to start. Uh, uh, there's too many players that are better at decent prices to be scrabbling around the dregs of 4s and 4.5s for me. So I wouldn't. But, you know, having him on the bench there like a Kabore and all that... Fine, leave them on the bench, though. That's where they belong. FPL booster, is Bowen the better punt over Sterling this game week? I don't think you'd ever make a transfer for one game week anyway. But if you look at the next three, because I think Chelsea have have Bournemouth and Fulham and uh, Forrest is the next one. So then they've got Bournemouth and Fulham and they've got one tough game. I think Sterling over three or four is better. He might know his wild card in an international break. If he does, then my answer to that is yes, by the way. Um, otherwise, no. Yeah, I think Sterling. I think Sterling. If it's just, even Nottingham Forest is still a decent enough fixture and it's at Stamford Bridge. Luton, it's their first game at Kenilworth Road and it's a way fixture for West Ham. Uh, didn't we have last year the stats around Bowen where all of his points were scored at home, basically, give or take? Wasn't it like 80% of his points were scored at home? If you remember, did that affect him at Brighton at the weekend? Would that touch him? It didn't. I mean, some. But goal, that's because it? we're title contenders. Can I? Can yeah. I tell you how happy Sidge was with that goal? Well, yeah, it was just it was a beautiful was thing a beautiful to watch. Goal. Beautiful thing to watch. Uh, Tim FPL Timbo's team says uh, evening, gents. It's morning evening. now. Evening. Fish and chips is on the agenda. He's currently on holiday in Cornwall. Option one: eat it on the bent bet on a bench with the risk of seagulls and sand. Eat it in the shop with people in the queue watching or take it home. Take it home, mate. Sit properly, relax, take it home. I know you lose a bit of the Seagulls are vicious bastards. I I hate (laughs) seagulls almost as much as I hate aubergines, mate. I'll be honest with you. So, yeah, definitely option one is not even, not even, not even a consideration. Uh, Eat in the shop with people queuing, not so much, but take it home. Take it home. Yeah, I'm agree. Reheat it in the microwave, but a low wattage. Or... Just walk, walk home with it away from the seagulls. Maybe. I was in Bournemouth, Se- we, we was in Bournemouth recently and you said Se- seagulls, seagulls in places to, other than Brighton. Uh, yeah, it's And true. yet they're just diving the table and nick people's food and shit. They, they don't care. Let's give the last question of the show to FPL Meerkat. Is FPL getting less fun the more optimised it's becoming? It's, it's as optimised as you allow it to become. I, I agree with you. I think 
where I would look at that in the lenses, I mean, we don't do it, but a lot of the videos that are out and available on YouTube at the moment, and this is not a criticism, but coming from the AI sites or the algorithm sites or the predictor sites are very heavily focusing content around transfers that the computer says you should make. AI says this, optimized, optimal transfer is this, your team rating is like 9 out of 10 or 99% or whatever it is. There is a lot more focus in the content that's out there around what the algos are saying that you should create. So I do think that uh, it's becoming more optimized, FPL, in in that space. But but like you said, it's as much as you allow it. So if I'm choosing to watch a video created by a website or content creators that have a vested interest in AI and algos, then obviously that's what they're going to talk about. Yeah, I think it's like what you you always say when people say, oh, is FPL becoming boring? It's like, well, do something different then. Yeah, yeah. That's what, it, that's what you always say, game. and I agree with make that. Make it your so. own game. Like, it, it, There's no one judging on whether or not you're... you're Look, there's lots of good choices. We've spoken, you know, literally just between kind of the six and eight million bracket. I mean, there's more than five good choices in there at the moment. And that's, Definitely that's no Salah, no Rashford, no Saka. Like, so there's loads, right? So I don't think everyone's got quite the same team that you think, for example. So, you know, there's people like me sitting here with Watkins and stuff. There's others who will have sold. There's others who might be thinking of even buying this week because of Van Dyke's suspension, perhaps the way Liverpool are defensively and stuff. So there's many different ways to to play this and, and now goes a, a one of them if people want to follow the models and stuff or or adjust them to their own personal specifications like it's fine what do I always say Serge? come on you Spurs <laughs> that. No, play it your way exactly that and on that note I uh, hope you've enjoyed the show make sure you're subscribed hit the like uh, button or thumbs up or whatever it may be wherever you are leave this show a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever it may be because uh, it makes us smile, and we'll be back at you tomorrow with Sky. Stay safe. Chat for now. Thanks, everyone. Can you Spurs play it your way? Cue music, please. Man child. What did you score in Sky, by the way? Points wise. Oh, over 100. Yeah, but how many over 100? Uh, maybe one. <laughs> I, can't, I can't think so. Roughly, yeah. I had a monster week, mate.